Matthew chapter 4, verses 17 through 20. And the word of God today reads from the King James text. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, you can turn that off, Martin, if you'd like. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. Amen. I want to talk to us for a little while today using the right bait. Amen. Using the right bait. Will you bow your heads with me one more moment? King Jesus, lover of men's souls, Savior of lost mankind, the face of the glory of God. We come before you today humbly. God is your servant. I come before you acknowledging how greatly the anointing of the Holy Ghost is necessary if I am to be effective in delivering the word of God to your people at this hour. I ask God that you would anoint me. Lord, that I would humbly allow myself to be used of you this day to speak the word of God. Keep man-made thoughts, man-made tradition, man-made dogma off my lips and allow only a word from the Lord to proceed. For God today, people, especially God's people, are not benefited except by the word of God. For the scriptures teach us, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Let the word of God and the word of God alone go forth from this pulpit. Master, touch our ears today, that our hearts might be prepared to receive, not just for our ears to hear, but for our heart to receive with gladness the word of God, that that seed might be sown in our heart, Lord, that it might bring forth fruit unto righteousness to the glory of God for your name's sake. We ask it all today in that precious thing, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. amen. You may be seated this afternoon. Amen. Matthew chapter 4, verses 17 through 20. We read the story of Jesus coming upon Peter and his brother Andrew. They're fishermen. And the Lord sees them and he calls out to them and he says, Follow me and I will make you fishers. Of men. Do you know today that as people of God, God has called us to be fishers of men? It's not just about Johnny getting into heaven for yourself. It's not just about making heaven for yourself. It's about bringing somebody with you. Hallelujah. I don't want to get to heaven and, and have worked myself to death my whole life just to stay in the faith and keep my faith intact so that I can enter through the pearly gates. I want to have a whole net full of y'all to drag behind me. Hallelujah. I want to have a whole net full of folks to drag behind me. I want the Lord to be able to look at me and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. You've done what I asked you to do. And I asked you, don't come alone. Amen. You know how you get invitations and it says RSVP? And it say, oh, bring a date, you know. They, they don't want you to come alone. You know, get somebody and bring them with you. Well, I've got news for you today. It is our job. It is our calling. It is the commandment of the Lord. To preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not everybody is a preacher and God didn't design it so that everybody be a preacher. Part of the reason y'all are here today is because you enable me as a God called preacher of the gospel. You enable me to do my job. 
and I do my job on your behalf. I preach so you don't have to. Do you follow what I'm saying? But your being here enables me to do it so you don't have to. Somebody's got to preach because the Bible said by the preaching of the gospel, God chose to save them that were lost. People are saved. People come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ through the preaching of the gospel. So the preaching of the word is an important function, but we are not all preachers. We're not all prophets. We're not all evangelists. We're not all teachers. No, everybody in the body has a different function and serves a different purpose. The apostle Paul said, how can they preach except they be sent? Meaning, if a preacher is going to do his job, he needs somebody to support him and help him and be there so that he can do his job. Amen. You understand me? That's why you are here today. You're holding up the preacher's hands. Do you know how much easier it is for me to get up and preach when there's more of you in this room than it is if there's two or three and I'm just staring at a couple of faces? It's hard to preach when you've got but a couple of faces look at. It encourages me when more people are here. That's why I wish that we're missing some people today. I wish they were here because every person who belongs here it encourages the pastor it encourages the preacher when everybody's in their place amen you follow my line of logic a little bit there jesus christ called us to be fishers of men i remember one time tommy and i went up to a uh, conference in uh, little rock arkansas and i heard this preacher preaching and he was talking about how uh, God called us to be fishers of men, and he was saying, you know, uh, you got to do what you got to do to put the bait on the hook to get people. If you want young people to come to the church, well, then you got to use this worldly sounding music. You got to use this music that, you know, appeals to young people, Lisa, in order to get them. You got to bait the hook in order to catch the fish, because God called us to be fishers of men. Now, y'all might think I'm being a little contradictory considering what I've used as the title today, but you'll understand by the time I'm done in a two or three hours. <laughs> Our visitors just, I just saw their eyes roll like they're about to pass out. I'm teasing. It shouldn't be that long, maybe one or two. Anyway, uh, you might think it's a little contradictory, but it's not. And I'm listening to this man, and I said, you know, to myself, I thought, I'm old time, I told you, I'm old time Pentecost, folks. I come from a church in Fort Worth where I saw the power of God come down like rain on many, many, many occasions. We used to shout in that place. Our sanctuary at Riverside didn't have any windows in it. So when we shouted, the only thing that could happen is the roof could vibrate a little bit. You know, the roof could kind of go a little bit because there wasn't nowhere for the shout to go. But uh, I'm going to tell you, I was in services. We had 300 people. The Holy Ghost fell. We shouted so loud, you thought that that, that building was going to collapse. The power of God came down in that place like you ain't never seen. I saw services, Martin, where young people, teenagers, had come under the power of God and were shouting and dancing down the aisles, teenagers, 12 years old, 13 years old, 17 years old, 19 years old, and they were shouting and running the aisles and dancing all over that church. And guess what? It didn't have anything to do with anything Kirk Franklin wrote. Had to do with the power of God. I've got news for you today, church. The minute the church starts baiting the hook with with items of worldly design we have lost our fight we have lost our battle we have lost our vision we have lost our conviction we are not doing the job right Amen. Mm -hmm. you make people believe that the church is here to entertain then i've got news for you people are going to come to church to be entertained that's right yeah if that's your message then that's what people are going to believe and every Sunday, Martin, they're going to come expecting a big old stage show. You go to a lot of mega churches today, man, they got fog machines, they got light shows. 
They've got all this foolishness going on. And I've got news for you today. And our visitors are saying, oh boy, what kind of church did we fall into today? <laughs> don't be too afraid. I'm not that bad. I don't bite. I nibble a little, but I don't bite. But I've got news for you today, folks. All of those things are substitutes for the move of God and the power of God. I don't ever want to bring a substitute in because when you bring in a substitute, then there's no room for the real thing. Hello now. That's right. That's right. You start substituting, there ain't no room for the real thing. Honey, I'm diabetic. I have to drink my coffee with sweet and low, okay? Now, if I put sweet and low in my coffee, there is no room for real sugar. Because if you put real sugar on top of the sweet and low I've already put in there, it's going to be so sweet you can't drink it. Am I telling the truth? So you better leave room for the real thing. Because the minute you put a substitute in, the real thing is no longer welcome. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I don't ever want to substitute anything for the power of God in this church. Amen. I pray before service, every service, I'm up here praying. God, give us a move of God. Give us a move of the Holy Ghost. If you don't understand this ministry, we are an affirming ministry. We welcome everybody, straight, gay, cross-eyed, or blind. Uh, if you want to know God, if you want to serve God, if you love God, you are welcome here. Amen. Period. End of the story. Case closed. It's a tough work. Say, well, brother, you know, that... You should have people banging down the door to come to a church that believes like that. <laughs> yeah, right. Try it. Try to build a work like this and see how easy it is. Oh, like I said before, we're too liberal for some. We're too conservative for others. Okay. But I pray for the power of God to be manifest in this church. I pray for the move of God to fill this church because I know what the real thing looks like. And honey, there ain't nothing better than the real thing. You have never been in a church service in your life until you've been in a church service where the power of God falls like rain. You ain't never been in nothing. It will change your life, literally. One service like that, and you will forever be changed. You will never, ever, ever again in your entire life want to be in a dead old dry church where the power of God is not present. I hate dead old dry churches. That's why I'm trying to get us to get a little more life in us. I'm trying to get people to get a little more active and a little more involved. Clap your hands a little more. Shout a little more. Get happy a little more. Act like you're glad to be saved. Act like you're glad to know Jesus. Act like you're glad that God has reached down and touched your life and helped you to realize that he is not a condemner, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Hallelujah. God didn't send the Lord Jesus Christ to earth so that we could be condemned. He sent the Lord so we could be saved. Hallelujah. God has called us to be fishers of men. The whole reason this church exists is not just so that we as believers can be fed and edified and grow in our faith and keep our faith intact. Because, folks, the world is attacking our faith every day. I don't mean, listen to me now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not talking about attacking religion. Fundamentalist Christianity is religion. And people attack fundamentalist Christianity because of the way a lot of fundamentalist Christians behave. So it's their faith in being attacked, their religion is being attacked. That's right. Hello now. But there are many things in the world today that are attacking our faith. That there are things in the world today that science and television programs and various things that are trying to convince you that faith in God is folly. Faith in God is foolishness. Why would anybody believe in God? Well, that's just crazy. Have you ever seen anything on television? Have you ever seen a scientist talking and they talk like, you know, people of faith are just plain crazy? They're just stupid. Well, it's dumb to believe God created the world. Well, we know that evolution is true. We know for a fact that evolution is true. Um, I only have one little problem with all of your scientific theory. 
I'm not going to argue about it. If you want to believe we evolved from apes, hallelujah. Uh, you know, looking at some of these scientists, I can believe their great, 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 great grandfather was, you know, a gorilla. I can believe it. But I believe the word of God. I believe what the word says. I believe that God created the world. I believe he did it by the word of his mouth. I believe that he spoke the worlds into existence. Uh, but you have science and you have teachers in schools. You have uh, textbooks. You have television programs that are constantly coming against the very notion of faith. So our faith is intact. So we come to church partly to help keep our faith intact. Amen. So we don't lose our faith. So that our faith doesn't come under such an attack that we just say, oh, well, it's too much. I quit. I give up. Why should I even bother trying to believe God? Why should I even bother trying to live for God? Why why should I even bother trying to walk in relationship with God? So that's part of the reason we come to the house of God. But one of the primary purposes the church of the living God exists is so that we can function as a lifeboat. So that we together can cast the net into the water and see if we can't find some poor soul that we can drag up on the deck who otherwise would be lost for eternity. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. Amen. That's our function. That's our purpose. That's why we're here. God has called us to be fishers of men. Say, well, pastor, you just said a few minutes ago that this notion of baiting your hook with the right bait and baiting it a certain way in order to bring people in, why, that's not a true notion. That's not a right notion. No, it's not a right notion. First of all, if you notice when the Lord said to Peter and Andrew, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, they weren't casting hooks. They weren't using bait. Hello now. They were using nets. You know what you get when you throw a net out? Whatever that net happens to catch. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. You ever go out in the ocean, you throw a net out, I got news for you, honey. If you think the only thing going to come up in that net is the fish that you want, you're wrong. You're going to get crabs up in there. You're going to get a, a squid up in there. You're going to get eels up in there. You ever watch any of these television shows that deal with fishing? You know, that Alaska fishing show or whatever it is. When they bring that net up, they got to sort out, Martin, because there's a whole bunch of stuff winds up in that net that they aren't really fishing for. It's not that there isn't a market for it. Hello now. It's not that you couldn't eat it. It's not that they couldn't even make money with it. It's just not what they're fishing for. I've got news for you today, church world. You need to quit dropping your line in the water with your bait trying to get what you want to get the way you think. You need to get it, and you need to start casting a net. And if you get a bunch of LGBT people in the net along with the others, bring them on board the boat. Hallelujah. That's what the church is for. My God have mercy. You don't throw that net out and decide what you're going to get. And by God, that just happens to be what you get. That's why this church is here for everybody. Because we're casting a net. And whatever gets caught up in that net, baby, guess what? You're welcome here. You're welcome here. Can you imagine the Titanic going down? And can you imagine... Another ship coming by and saying, look at that crowd of folks over there. Let's throw a net down so we can help them onto the ship. And they bring that, that net up. And Lisa, they say, oh, no, this person's black. Let's throw them back. <laughs> Hello now. Oh, no, this person, no, they're a beast Indian descent. Let's throw them back. Oh, no, this person here, uh, they were a third pass. They were a third class passenger. Yeah, this person here now, hey, he's poor. We can now throw him back. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something. Over the years, this church has had people. Over the years, we've had people so poor, they, they couldn't afford to sneeze. We've had people that 
I, I hate to say it this way, but it's the only way I can make the point and y'all get it without me having to spend an hour. So goofy that few people wanted to put up with them, but you know what? We put up with them. You know why? Because God's called us to love. God's called us to cast the net. Amen. God's called us to take all comers. If people want to come to this church, uh, uh, Martin, and they're a little goofy and they're <laughs> they're a little unusual, their personality is not, you know, all together. They've got maybe some emotional issues and they've got some psychological. And y'all know I'm telling the truth. Some of y'all been with us long enough to know, and I'm telling the truth. We've had some real characters around here. But you know what? They've always been welcome, haven't they? Right. And we embrace them and we love them just like we embrace and love anybody else. Doesn't matter if they ever put a nickel in the offering plate. We've spent years driving to pick people up for church. Not news for you. It costs money to pick people up for church every Sunday. Somebody got to pay for the gas. Somebody got to, you know, uh, they're, they're taking their time. They're using their gas. We've spent years picking people up for church and never put a nickel in the offering plate. That's okay. It's not about money. It's about casting your net. It's about taking all comers. If God's church is going to be the kind of church God called his church to be, we're going to love everybody that steps through that door, whether they are perfect and balanced and whether they're smart, intelligent, educated, whether they make a lot of money, make a little money, it doesn't matter. We're going to take all comers. Amen. Amen. We're going to love them all the same. I'm going to do everything in my power as a pastor to help them make heaven their home. You're going to do everything in your power to encourage one another and to inspire one another. You're not going to be in judgment of one another. You're not going to be condemning one another. You're not going to be looking down on one another. Am I telling the truth today? This is Dallas, Texas, one of the most pretentious cities in the country, if not the world. And you know what? We don't care what kind of car you drive in this church. We don't care what kind of clothes you wear in this church. I don't care what the label on your shirt is, whether it come from Lord and Taylor or if it come from uh, Target. It don't matter to me no way. It doesn't matter to us whether your address is Highland Park or whether your address is Pleasant Grove. You're welcome in this church. Am I telling the truth today, folks? Amen. Amen. Doesn't matter what language is your primary language. As long as I can talk to you and you can understand me, even if it's difficult, that's okay. That's okay. See, we're not racist. We're not homophobic. We don't have any issues. Everybody and anybody that wants to be part of God's church is welcome in this place because we have been called to be fishers of men. If you fish, the way that Peter and Andrew fished, let me tell you how that works. It's very simple. You take your boat out. I've got news for you. Fishermen know where the fish are. Amen. Tommy and I have gone on uh, whale watching adventures. You know, we go up to uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. I have family up there. I'm originally from Connecticut. We have a bunch of my, my, my mother's side of the family is Portuguese descent. And I have a whole bunch of Portuguese family on Cape Cod. And we'll go to visit family on the Cape. And we go whale watching. I love to go whale watching. I love animals. I, I love all of God's creation. And I love animals. I love to swim with dolphins. I avoid wearing a gray bathing suit because I don't want them to think I'm one of them. <laughs> When I go whale watching, you know, I make sure I wear something colorful because I don't want them to think I'm one of them either. You know, but I love to go whale watching. I've got news for you. You go whale watching, Lisa. Those boat captains don't just drive out into the middle of the ocean somewhere and say, well, I hope a whale comes by. <laughs> Let's just sit here for a few hours and see if a whale comes by. No, 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 no. They know exactly where those whales feed at. They know exactly where those whales uh, their road is, so to speak, in the ocean, you know, where they travel. They know exactly where the whales are at. And Martin, they take you out in that boat, and they take you right to where the whales are. Well, I've got news for you today. Fishermen know where the fish are. Fishermen know where the fish are. 
Peter and Andrew, they didn't fish by the seat of their pants. They didn't just throw a net out anywhere that they felt like throwing a net out. No, they knew where the fish ate at. They knew where the conditions were just right to accommodate a certain type of fish. See, there are some areas you go to, and there are certain fish that are likely to be in this area because there's a lot of kelp. There's a lot of plant life. There's a lot of whatever. You go to this other area, and there'll be a whole bunch of other fish in this other area because the conditions accommodate the other kind. Do you follow what I'm saying? These fishermen do that. They know, they know generally where the fish are at now. Just like anything else, conditions sometimes aren't so grand. You may go to where the fish are supposed to be, and guess what? You come up with an empty net. It's because, for whatever reason, that particular day, maybe it's cold, maybe it's rainy, maybe whatever the case might be, and the fish decide, hey, we're going to stay close to the ground today. We don't want to go up higher. We've, it's too ugly out. We're going to stay low. You follow what I'm saying? But they know where the fish are. And they would go out and they would cast that net and they would get whatever happened to fall into the net, Lisa. That's how the church is supposed to do. Now I'm going to tell you, if you go fishing somewhere, it wouldn't hurt you, even if you're using a net, listen to me now, it wouldn't hurt you to throw a little bait on the water. If you're using the net, it wouldn't hurt you to drop little bit of corn on the water and see if them catfish don't come up top. Hello now. You want to fill your neck with catfish? You just throw some corn up on top of that water. Am I telling the truth, Johnny? Us country boys know what I'm talking about. You throw a little bit of that corn on top of the water, man, them, them fish are going to come up and they're going to start eating all that corn. Well, that makes your job a whole lot easier, doesn't it? Because now, not only do I know they're supposed to be there, but I can see them. Not only can I see them, but by reason of the bait I'm using, I'm able to bring them up where I can more easily get at them. So yeah, there are times when there is wisdom in using bait, even if you're casting a net. The question today for the church of God is, are we using the right bait? What has God called the church to use as bait? What has God called us to use, to lure the unsaved, to lure those who have lost hope, to lure those who have fallen away from the faith. What has God called us to use as faith? The word of God said in Romans 13, 8 through 10, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Guess what God expects us to cast upon the water if we're going to bring folks up to the surface who need to be saved? Your judgment? Your criticism? Your condemnation? No, love. Got news for you. I grew up in a fundamentalist Christian church. I grew up in a fundamentalist environment. Oh, they'd love you to death as long as you were the right kind of fish. <laughs> Just don't be queer, because if you're queer, we're going to hate your guts. And then, no, no, you got to go somewhere else. We're not interested in you in our church. Well, that's funny, honey. You ain't casting a net. You're baiting the hook. You're trying to get them one at a time. You're trying to get exactly what you want to get. So uh, you, you're not fishing the way God called people to fish. If you're going to be fishers of men, you just cast your net and let God fill it. And whatever God fills it with, I'm going to tell you something. In biblical times, they make use of it because you can afford to throw nothing away. My grandmother, my great-grandmother, a little Portuguese lady, 
bless their heart. Somebody go fishing, you know, and they catch something that was a little odd or a little strange that they didn't necessarily want to eat, but they decided, well, I know Mary, and Mary, she'll use it. She'll make use of it. They catch them a squid, you know. They bring it to my grandmother. My grandmother start licking her lips. Squid. The rest of us be going, no. I'm teasing. My grandmother could cook up a storm, honey. She'd make that thing something you'd want to eat. They'd bring up an eel. An eel. They didn't want to bring home the eel. They'd bring it to my grandmother. I'd look at that sneaky looking thing and I said, Grandma, you you gonna make that to eat? And she'd say, Oh, honey, that's some good eating there. You don't know. See, Portuguese folk know how to cook anything come out of the ocean. You bring up a good year tire, and I promise you, Grandma will have that thing fried and cooked up and seasoned, and you'll enjoy it. <laughs> I promise you'll enjoy it. They know how to make them some fish. But see, when you're when you're having to fish like that for survival back in the day, you didn't pick what you brought up. Uh, you brought up whatever you brought up, and you brought up whatever you had, and you brought it to market. Am I telling the truth? My Bible said that when the Lord sent out an invitation for his wedding, that all his good friends, all the good religious folk, all the good church folk were too busy to come. They all had too much going on. Yeah, that's what happens to religious folks. They get so caught up in themselves, they lose touch with their, their relationship with God. Am I telling the truth today? Don't ever think you can't get too religious to lose your walk with God, because you can. Religion will replace your walk with God, folks. You better be careful. Rules and regulations will replace your walk with God. Legalism, pharisaicalism will replace your walk with God. You better be careful. The Lord said, go into the highways and the byways and compel them. To come in. Hallelujah. What was he saying, Lisa? He was saying, cast your net and take whatever you get. Got news for you, folks. Jesus cast a net. He didn't fish with a hook. He didn't fish with bait. Uh-uh. Say, preacher, prove that to me. I'm not sure I believe you. Well, I'll tell you what, he had hookers. Hello now. He had prostitutes. Ooh. Prostitutes in his congregation. Boy, I'll tell you what, he'd lose his spot in the Southern Baptist Convention just so <laughs> fast. Just let it be known that a stripper from that old men's club down the street. I drive for Uber and Lyft, or I used to before I had issues where I, I couldn't really do it so much anymore. I had to carry a lot of young ladies home who were working at these little strip clubs. You know what I did? I invited them to church. I said, you know what, honey? I pastor a little church. I'd love for you to come somewhere. She said, you wouldn't want me in your church doing what I do. I said, sweetheart, what you do don't bother me none. Now, don't misunderstand me, children. I'm not saying I believe Christians ought to be working as strippers. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is, the minute the door is closed to the church, to a stripper, then that stripper can never become a child of God. That stripper can never come into relationship with Jesus Christ. That stripper can never know that there's a better life available to her. Am I telling the truth? Yes. 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 I'm going to cast a net. Hallelujah. I remember one time years ago, I was pastoring my very first church. <laughs> and one of the couples in our church owned a little Christian bookstore. And I was there one day, and another lady from our church, whose name was Judy, she worked for Leo and Sue, who owned the bookstore. And this woman came in the store, and she was acting very, very strange, very strange. Very odd. She looked very disheveled. She was dirty. She she looked pretty much like she was homeless, but at the same time, she wasn't quite homeless. She, she wasn't homeless. But her brain wasn't working right. She was talking to herself. 
she took a book and she literally laid down in the middle of the floor in the bookstore and started reading this book. And at one point, I'm standing by the register and I'm talking with Judy. And I said to Judy, I said, you, you want to know something? I said, that lady has a demon. See, I told you I'm old-fashioned Pentecostal. I believe that demons are real. I also believe that a demon hadn't got hope in the world of standing against the name of Jesus when it's spoken in faith and somebody speaks it with authority who knows who Jesus is. I said, that woman has a demon. And when I see a demon, I don't look at somebody judgmentally. I don't look at them critically. I look at them mercifully. I look at them with compassion. Because I got news for you. Ain't nobody in the world have a demon that wants it. A demon's not something you want in your life. Trust me. And I looked at that lady and my heart was broken for her because I knew that her life was in a wreck because of a demonic presence in her life. And at one point, she finally come up to the counter, and she talked to us for a few minutes. Her thinking was so scattered, she couldn't even put her words together right. And I said to her, I said, honey, I pastor a little church up here, and I give her a card. I said, we'd love for you to come be with us one Sunday. Oh, well, maybe I will. I said, well, we'd love for you to come. Okay, she leaves. Judy looks at me and says, you told me she had a demon. I said, yes. She said, why in the world do you invite her to church? I said, because we can help her. We can help her. See, the Lord called us to be fishers. And then I said, we're going to take whatever falls in the net. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to stay. Why in the world would I not invite her? I said, we can help that lady. I got news for you, folks. She showed up at church. Uh, I, if it wasn't that next Sunday, it was the one after that. She sat down about the second about where Tommy's at roughly. And during the song service, she put a she took a hanky out of her purse and she put it over her head, talking to herself while the worship service is going on. And then when I went to begin preaching, she said, Would you turn that damn thing down? Talking about the PA. I said, okay. And I turned it down a little bit. I came back. About then she got up and she walked off to the bathroom. When she went to the bathroom, I said, okay, everybody out of the building. I said, this preacher about to cast some demons out. I said, if you're not prayed up, fired up, and ready to go up, you don't need to be here. You don't want to see what you're going to see. But if you're a prayer warrior, if you're full of the Holy Ghost, and you know how to support the preacher while he does what's necessary, you stay. But everybody else go. We had, I'll never forget it, we had a couple of brand new first-time visitors in this. I said, of course. Of course, we'll have first-time visitors in a situation like this, you know. Let me tell you, everybody cleared that church out, so I never knew how unspiritual my people were until that Sunday. I mean, they cleared out of that building in two minutes flat. Leo stayed with me. He got over here on the right altar. June Bartell stayed with me. She got over on the left altar. You never forget your first folks. You never forget the name of your first church members. When when you're a 19-year-old pastor and you're pastoring your first church, you never forget these people. And bless her heart, I had two people out of a church full of 60 that stayed with me. The rest were backslidden. They ran out because they didn't want the devil to jump in them. You know, I'm teasing. One thing you never want to do is cast out demons in front of a child. Because you don't know what is going to happen. And children don't need to see it. Trust me, it'll scare the life out of you sometimes. Lady, come back. She sat down. She said, where did everybody go? I said, honey, everybody else has left. I said, we're going to help you. We're going to minister to you. I said, you need the Lord to help you. I said, I don't think you know what's going on. I said, but God's going to help you. When I said that, she stood up and she stepped in the center aisle. She went on her back like this, turned backwards. You know what they call a crab walk when you're in high yes. school? And did, she did a crab walk down the center aisle of the church. I said, devil, you sit down in that chair and don't that body move until this woman's delivered. She sat down in that chair and never moved another muscle until she was delivered. I began to cast demons out of her. I begin to call the spirits out by name. 
it took about two and a half hours. I was wrung out like a dishcloth by the time we were done. Literally, I was wrung out like a dishcloth by the time. It's spiritual warfare, folks. When we got all done, you know, her husband drove up. She said, she literally said to me, she said, I have no idea what's just happened. That's what she said to me after it was all done. She said, I have no idea what's just happened. She said, but I feel like I've lost about a thousand pounds. She said, I don't even know what just happened. She said, but I feel like I've lost a thousand pounds. She said, my husband was supposed to come at noon and pick me up. She said, oh, Lord, I hope he hasn't been sitting out there all the time. We went out with her to the front of the church and up drove her husband. Her husband said, I've been looking. I'm so sorry. I've been looking for this place for the last two and a half hours. I couldn't find it. God kept him from getting there early. The Lord kept him from getting there until that woman could be delivered. That woman left that day. She came back the next Sunday. Her hair was washed and set. Her clothes matched. She was of a sound mind. And we were looking at a brand new human being delivered from demonic oppression by the power of God. What would it have been if I were baiting a hook? What would it have been, Johnny, if I were only wanting this type of fish or that kind of fish, this kind of person or that kind of person? What would it have been if this preacher didn't have the mindset, I've been called to be fishers of men, and whatever falls into the net, bless God, I'm here to help them. What would it have been? If I'd have looked at that woman judgmentally or harshly, well, what does she do in her life to invite demons into her life? Because you've got to open a door. Demons don't just march in. They have to be invited in. But a lot of people do it unwittingly. People don't just now. There are some people do it on purpose. There are actually some old African religions where they literally believe in inviting a demon into your life. Okay. But not everybody does it on purpose, Lisa. Sometimes people do it inadvertently to circumstances, and I don't want to go into all that. I'm not teaching on spiritual warfare at the moment. But what would it have been if I couldn't look at that lady in her condition and love her? Jesus. See, I'm going to tell you something. A lot of churches can't help a lot of people because they can't love them. And if you can't love them, you can't help them. If you cannot have compassion on somebody, don't think for one minute that you can pray them through to a miracle. It'll never happen. Miracles happen in the word of God. Jesus performed miracles. The word of God said, and Jesus having compassion on them. And it was that compassion that gave birth to a miracle. Am I telling the truth? Oh, I want to tell you today, church, I don't ever want to preach a message in this church that inspires you to be judgmental of people, to be critical of people, to sit in condemnation of people. I want to preach a message in this church that encourages you to look at every person on this planet, every person outside of these walls with love and compassion. Because if you cannot see them with love and compassion, we cannot help them. If you cannot see them with love and compassion, I got news for you, folks. You're no use to them. You will you you might as well not even exist where they're concerned. Am I telling the truth today? What are we supposed to throw upon the water? Well, we're supposed to throw some bait, get the fish where we can see. It's easier to catch them if you know where they're at. It's easier to know where they're at if you can see them. So you can throw some bait out on the water, but what are we to use this bait? Love. Galatians 5.14, for all the law is fulfilled in one word. Even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. First Thessalonians 3.11-13, through 13, now God himself and our Father. Now you remember I've told you in the past, the word and uh, is a word in the Greek chi that also is able to be translated as epha. Because if you look at the way this verse is worded, now God himself and our Father, it almost sounds like you're talking about two people, God himself and our Father as, as a separate person. But no, you could say now God himself, even our Father, and then it says comma, and our Lord Jesus Christ, 
even our Lord Jesus Christ, direct our way unto you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men. Oh my, Lisa, that would make me think that God doesn't want us having people standing out at the gay pride parade with signs that says, God hates you, you're going to hell, queers are going to be destroyed. My, that would give me the impression, Martin, that I'm supposed to love everybody if I tell the truth today. He said, the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Now watch this. Even our Father. It's the same identical word in the Greek, but in this instance they translated it as even instead of and. Okay? At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. In James chapter 2 verses 4 through 10, I promise I'm trying to bring this to a close. So our, our uh, new folks that are visiting, y'all, if you're hungry and your stomachs are growling, hang in there. We'll get you out of here pretty quick. James 2, 4 through 10. And ye not then partial in yourselves are become judges of evil thoughts. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and the heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him. But ye have despised the poor. Sounds like a political party in our country today, doesn't it? Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called. If ye fulfill the royal law, According to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin. Hmm, that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? If ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin. And are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. 1 John 3, 17 through 18. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Say, Pastor, why is it that when somebody in the church has a need, you go out of your way to try to meet that need? I'll tell you why, because I've got the love of God in me. If there's any way I can help you, I'm going to help you. If there's any way we can help one another, we're going to help one another. Amen? Because that's how the love of God manifests itself. Somebody in the church is, is falling short or somebody in the church is needing something. We go out to eat after church. We go to Denny's. I know it's not you know, the, the greatest place in the world, but it's pretty decent. They make wonderful pancakes if you like pancakes. Our policy in this church has been since the first day I started it on Easter Sunday, 2002. Everybody wants to go, goes. Everybody. See, I grew up in church. After church, they used to go out and eat a lot. You know, my mother never had money. My father was not a Christian and he wasn't a very nice man and he never gave my mother money for nothing. My poor mother, bless her heart. And unless my grandmother happened to have a little extra money and she could take us, we would go home and everybody else in the church would go to Howard Johnson's or go to McDonald's and they'd have a wonderful time of fellowship and food. And you know what? I, I used to miss that. I used to love oh the few opportunities we had to do it. It was so wonderful to me to go out with church folks, you know, and not be in church, you know. 
be where we could talk and joke and goof around and have a good time and just be human with one another and get to know one another at a, at a, at a human level, you know? And Martin, I used to really resent the fact that I wasn't able to participate as often as I would have loved to it. And I'm talking even when I was a kid. So ever since I've been pastoring, and it's been over 35 years now, every church I have ever pastored, we've had the same policy. You come, I don't care if you're broke, is Job's turkey. You come, you eat with us, somebody will pick up your check, don't you worry about it. Everybody's going to participate. Now, I hope you'll be nice enough not to order lobster and, you know. <laughs> Let me tell you, we've had some folk who thought if somebody else was paying the check, they'd get everything on the menu. I've, I've literally had that happen, you know. But, you know, but seriously, we don't we don't tell you what to order or how much, you know. You can order whatever you want, but, I mean, just know that somebody else is paying for you and, you know, be a little reasonable. And that is our policy. And that has been our policy. And we have had people attend this church for years that we had to go pick up for church and bring to church. And guess what? They were always broke, and we bought them a meal after church every Sunday for years. And guess how much money they put in the treasury? Not a nickel. So again, I'm trying to express to you, it's not about money. We don't care about that. That's not the issue. We're going to do the right thing regardless of whether they put a nickel in the offering plate or not. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? You see, I know you can't outgive God. I know the word of God said, given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaking together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. I know God's word is true. I know it's dependable. I know I can count on it. And therefore, I'm going to do everything in my power. Johnny, Bill, when, when the old truck started giving us trouble, I'm going to do everything in my power to help you guys get that truck back on the road. Right, Martin? Yeah. That's the way this preacher believes. That's the way I do. That's the way Christians ought to conduct themselves. Because we're supposed to be motivated in all things by love. Hallelujah. I'm almost done. I promise. <laughs> Art, you better not laugh too hard. I'll come slap you. I've known you long enough. I can slap you. Amen. <laughs> Galatians 8. Excuse me, let me finish 1 John 3, 17 and 18. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother hath need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Don't tell me you love me, show me you love me. Hello now. Right. Amen. I'm not going to tell you I love you and then let you go home hungry. I'm not going to tell you I love you when I can help you get your car fixed and let you go home and suffer and try to figure out how to get your car fixed. No, no, no. That's not how it works. I'm going to show you I love you. Hello now. Amen. Galatians chapter 6, 9 through 10. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Black, white, gay, straight, poor, rich, ugly, pretty, fat, skinny. Let us do good unto all men. Especially unto them who are of the household of faith. In other words, especially under one another. But let's do good to everybody. Got news for you folks. Picketing the abortion clinics, picketing the gay pride parade, uh, that does not fall into doing good unto all men. That is not putting corn out on the water to attract the fish. Hello now. That is not baiting in a manner that's going to bring people to you. What you're doing instead is you're scattering them and you're sending them flying so that when you cast your net, they're going to be nowhere to be found. Lastly today, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, excuse me, 13, not wearing the glasses, and verse 8, I should know better than that. I'll have y'all going off somewhere with probably isn't even a passage. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 8. Charity, meaning love, Never fail it. 
But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. What is the Apostle Paul telling the church at Corinth? He is telling the church that love will endure throughout eternity. Love is not merely a temporary uh, means to an end. No, it's not a temporary means to an end. Love is eternal. It'll be with us forever. When the gifts of the Spirit are no longer necessary because we're standing in the presence of God, who needs tongues and interpretation? Who needs prophecy when you got God standing right in front of you and when you can see him as he is? You don't need those things anymore. But love will be with us forever because God's very nature is love. And if God's people are going to be what we're called to be, fishers of men, we're going to bait the water, not the hook. And we're going to bait it with love. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son, don't forget the very next verse, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Everybody loves to quote John 3.16, but may forget all about John 3.17. Don't forget about John 3.17. Our message is not a message of condemnation. Our message is not a message of guilt. Our message is not a message of judgment. Our message is not a message of fear. Our message is a message of love. God loves you. He went to lengths you can't even imagine. So that he could be in relationship with you. He wants you to be able to love him back. And guess what? He loved you first. The Apostle Paul said we love him because he first loved us. You can't love God first. You couldn't if you wanted to. Because he loved you long before you were ever a twinkle in your daddy's eye. He knew you were coming. He knew you'd be there. He knew one day you'd be sitting on this church seat today. He knew one day you'd be watching online. And he said, I already love them. Amen. Amen. You ever seen a lady pregnant with a baby? And she says, I'm already in love with this baby. The baby's not even born yet. And I already love this baby. Got news for you. God loved you before you were even walking this planet. And he manifested himself in human form. Died on the cross of Calvary, was buried three days in a borrowed tomb, rose again on the third day, physically, literally rose again. And he's ascended to heaven, and he's waiting for the day to come take away his bride. Amen. Are you using the right bait today? Are you inviting people to church? Are you welcoming them to the kingdom of God with love? Or are you scattering and scaring the life out of them so they're running in every direction, lest the net of the gospel touch them? Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.